Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Nebula. In 1980 and 1981, cable television was still young, media consolidation hadn't happened to nearly the extent that it has today, and you had dozens of companies attempting to carve out their own niche. In those years alone, a bunch of channels started that all aimed to be a bit more highbrow, most of them with some major powerhouse backing. ABC Arts, NBC's The Entertainment Channel, and CBS Cable. But they mostly failed fairly quickly, unable to keep up with the number one arts and culture channel, Bravo. As originally conceived, Bravo was the home to not just classic films with an emphasis on non-American foreign films, but also it staged its own Shakespeare productions, musical performances, and even operas. One of its early successful shows was called Jazz Counterpoint, which solely focused on interviews with jazz musicians. And even throughout the 90s, it took risks on bringing acclaimed but little known BBC shows like Cold Lazarus to American audiences. And it was actually pretty successful with this overall strategy for a couple decades. Of course, that all feels pretty hard to believe now. Bravo is best known today as the channel of reality shows like Below Deck, Vanderpump Rules, and their crown jewel, The Real Housewives franchise. They went from the opera and cinema of Jean-Luc Godard to Tom and Stassi screaming at each other at a book signing. Bravo has definitely come a long way. They're one of the more extreme examples of something that everyone who has or had cable television is probably familiar with, channel drift, where a channel, for one reason or another, decides to abandon its original mission statement and reshape itself, often resulting in a lot of cheap reality TV completely taking over. To me, this is a really fascinating process, if often a pretty depressing one, and it's definitely what I wanted to talk about this week. So first, I should start with maybe the most famous example of channel drift ever, MTV. Ladies and gentlemen, rock and roll. So obviously complaining that MTV is no longer about music is far from a new or original thought. It wasn't even new in 2004 when Bowling for Soup's pop punk hit 1985 mentioned it in the chorus of the song. The fact is, MTV has now been running away from its music video based identity for kind of the majority of its lifespan. And that makes sense, I don't think airing whole blocks of music videos all day would have done well in 2005, let alone 2023. And you know, to be fair to them, there is the fairly obscure MTV Classic channel, which does just that. But I think MTV's change gets under the skin of a lot of older viewers because, for the most part, Outside of airing the VMAs every year, the M in MTV is a relic of a channel that doesn't really exist anymore. And that wasn't always the case. Even when it wasn't all just music videos, the channel used to have a heavy emphasis on the medium, from music news to its iconic MTV Unplugged series. It's very unlike Food Network, which has also drastically changed the kind of programming it made through the years, but is also still strongly associated with, you know, food. MTV's brand, on the other hand, has kind of drifted all over the place. Sometimes that's had really fun results, with cult classic animated shows like Daria and Clone High, but mainly with different forms of reality TV. And you know, to be fair to MTV, those reality show roots run pretty deep too. Though there were some examples of reality docu-series on American TV before the real world, especially on PBS with shows like An American Family, which were a little more academic in nature, the real world is the show that changed reality TV forever, directly inspiring things like Big Brother over in Europe, among so many others. And look, I'll be completely honest with my bias here, I am generally not a fan of reality TV, especially of the people yelling at each other variety. But when you go back to that 1992 original season, retroactively called The Real World New York, it is easy to see why it took TV by storm. It's actually kind of a bizarre experience watching it today. Like the blueprint for so much of what modern reality TV is, is kind of all there. A bunch of young people trying to make it in NYC all move into a loft together where they often clash and have heart-to-heart -heart conversations. 
but it's the details that make it feel so different, mainly in that it actually feels like a documentary. There are some moments of real downtime, parts where you feel like a fly on the wall in a show that's maybe okay with not shoving constant stimulation down your throat and letting a moment breathe. The contestants feel far more sincere. Sure, some of them yell and shout, but there clearly was less producer input into their behavior than there is in these shows now, and no one on the show feels like they're trying to behave like a reality show archetype for airtime, since those didn't exist yet. Honestly, I found it to be an interesting and pretty refreshing watch overall. But with its success, MTV cracked the code on something that would slowly change its entire trajectory. See, the real world was cheap. Like, really cheap. And as long as there were young people who wanted to be on TV, it was extremely easy to recreate as well. And so they did, over and over and over again. And of course, they didn't stop there. There would be no Jersey Shore and its still ongoing empire that the show built off its boardwalk bickering without the real world. And it's not a stretch to say that other cable channels definitely took notice. Still, I don't think I can totally blame the real world for like TLC going from the Learning Channel, which aired educational content, to where it is now with MILF Manor. The real world is a big piece of the puzzle, but it's far from the only factor here. For one thing, there was a lot of channel acquisitions. Bravo's mission statement shifted almost overnight when it was bought by NBC Universal in 2002, and by 2003, they had hit reality shows. Then there's the simple fact that many cable channels wanted to ride the coattails of popular scripted network shows. It's easy to forget now, but the Real Housewives franchise was created to capitalize on the huge popularity of ABC's soapy drama Desperate Housewives, which had been a massive hit two years before. Same goes with MTV's Laguna Beach, The Real Orange County, which found a very cheap way to cash in on Fox's hit The O.C. Reality TV continued to rev up in the early 2000s, especially on cable, and then it was almost supercharged by the events of 2007, when the Writers Guild of America, America's TV writers, went on strike, mostly to secure a more fair share of DVD sales. This sent the reality genre to the next level. Because these shows technically don't have writers, they were able to continue production. More and more channels embrace the ultra-cheap and ultra-popular format, peaking in 2015, with 750 reality shows airing new seasons on American TV that year. And by that point, almost no one was immune. Channels that had worked for a decade or more to establish respected brand identities chucked those identities out the window as fast as they could. And seemingly overnight, you were far more likely to see a show about pawn shops on the History Channel than a documentary about anything historical. Discovery Channel, which had been kind of neck and neck with Nat Geo in terms of like respected nature programming, picked up a ton of shows that were in the mold of Alaska Bush people. And then there's A&E, which actually had an arc kind of similar to Bravo's. It went from covering classical music, then had a hit with biography, a documentary series, became known as like the primary home for Law & Order reruns for a few years, before eventually winding up the Kingdom of Duck Dynasty. Even Sci-Fi renamed itself something that looked more like Siffy and tried to get more into the reality game. Honestly, the list of channels that went in this direction feels endless. Sure, some channels like AMC had more success with scripted dramas, but on the whole, those were far riskier and a lot less consistent than a show like Duck Dynasty, which was basically a sitcom that was even cheaper to shoot than an actual sitcom. Shows like Ridiculousness, which is probably playing on MTV right this second, managed to be even cheaper than most reality TV, as it's basically just America's Funniest Home Videos with a fresh coat of paint. Once the reality and competition show formats caught on, it subsumed cable television. And soon, so much of what had made these channels feel unique or different from one another faded away. Some were able to more or less maintain their identities, like the Food Network or HGTV, which whatever else you can say about them are still about food and homes. But others lost that identity completely, 
leaving a channel like History kind of a shell of its former self. At the end of the day though, it's clear there was, and is, a huge audience for these shows. And I get it, while stuff like Vanderpump Rules mostly just kinda bums me out, I completely understand someone wanting to watch an episode of like, Chopped over something more complex and involved after a long day at work. But I feel like the overall impact of these shows, and channel drift in general, just made cable feel extremely samey, right as streaming came along to steal its thunder. Still, I think it's worth remembering that there was a time in the not too distant past when people actually thought that they could have a successful cable channel programming foreign films and operas. And for a while at least, they were right. So much of this video has been focused on TV channels abandoning their original goals and creating much more generic shows to keep up with the changing cable landscape. It's kind of a depressing process, and something that I think you can see on YouTube as well, as we all try to keep up with an ever-fickle algorithm. That's why I was impressed by Night of the Coconut, Patrick H. Willem's full-length movie. If you like Patrick covering film on here, this really takes it to the next level. I can't recommend it enough. And the only reason he was able to make something like it was because of our subscribers on Nebula. Plus, in addition to great originals like Night of the Coconut, you can take part in Nebula classes, a great way to learn from established creators and a really good idea if you're looking to get into content creation yourself. So if you sign up using the link below, you can support me directly and get both Nebula and Nebula classes for 40% off an annual plan. Basically, just over $250 a month. An incredible deal on a service that just gets better and better. So be sure to check it out at the link below. Here's a special tip for the fellas and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.